So, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our uh, panel on the Belarusian economy uh, entitled Ways Out of the Impasse in uh, Belarus. Um, my name is Richard Gleefson. I'm Deputy Director here at uh, VEV. And I am very pleased, uh, proud, in fact, that, that we can gather together such an excellent panel of, of experts to discuss these issues today. Um, bit of background first on this event. We've been discussing this uh, since the summer, the idea of having this event. And I think it's become clear to a lot of us uh, who look at Eastern Europe in general, um, how much we actually don't know about Belarus and about the Belarusian economy and how many new questions this, uh, this crisis this year uh, has, has thrown up. Obviously in the summer there were huge political events, there was a lot of noise, a lot of coverage in the media of that. And when we discussed it with, with Ruman, and our, our Belarus expert, we decided to wait a little bit um, till, till that in initial uh, wave of, of media coverage had died down and tried to then drill in a little bit more to the structural aspects of this crisis from an economic perspective. So what's happening now and also uh, what the future might bring for the, for the Belarusian uh, economy. I think we're, we're at that point now. It is time to, to discuss these, these bigger issues and I'm very much looking forward to that uh, today. Ruman, our, our Belarus expert, wrote a paper for us uh, a few weeks ago now looking at some of these questions and especially at the, the policy aspects of, of, of the economy in, in Belarus at the moment. And that in a way frames the whole discussion that we're, we're going to have today and Ruman will present uh, in a minute that, that paper before we start uh, to discuss with the, with the panel. The experts we have with us today, as I said, I'm really happy. I think, you know, we've really gathered together uh, the best there is in terms of, of analyzing these questions. And I would like to introduce them all very briefly now. So first of all, we have Ruben Dobrinsky. He is our VEV Belarus expert. He's a senior uh, research, research associate at VEV with a very long history of looking at the, at the Belarusian economy. We have Katarina Bornukova, who is the academic director at BEROK in Minsk and uh, the, the BEROK Economic uh, Research Center in Minsk. We have Dmitry Kruk, who is a research associate uh, at BEROK. And we have Alexander Chubrik, who is the director of the IPM uh, Research Center in Belarus. I wanted to say at the start as well, just a big uh, thank you to all of you for being here. I mean, it's been a difficult year, I think, for everybody. Probably everybody listening to this panel would say this has not been a great year in their life. But I think for you, especially being in Belarus and living through this time, uh, we cannot imagine what it's like for you, but I'm sure it's not been easy. And therefore, especially thank you that you're here, that you're willing uh, to talk to us about these issues. And we really, uh, we really appreciate it uh, very much. The panel today will last one and a half hours. I think that's the minimum to, to try to get through what, what we want to get through. It will start, as I said, with a presentation from, from Ruman of, of his paper. Then we'll have a discussion. And there are really three questions that we want to address here. The first one is what to do about the state-owned companies and the reform of the state-owned companies in Belarus. The second one is to deal with uh, the, the economic and the social fallout of, of what mass restructuring uh, would mean in Belarus. And thirdly, to look at some of the financial uh, and the external aspects uh, of this crisis and also of, of, of the future for Belarus. The last thing for me, and then I'll, I'll pass over to Ruman, is just uh, about the questions. So this is actually the first time we've done a debate like this. Uh, it allows everybody to be on the screen together. We prefer it that way. Questions should be asked via slide or the slido, or however you say it. Uh, you can see the link, I think, under the screen. Uh, I have it here on my phone as well, so I will see the questions come in. Please ask them there with the hashtag Belarus, and, um, and I will choose as many as I can and, and ask them to the participants. So that is it from me uh, for now. Uh, I will now pass to Ruman, who is going to talk uh, about the, the paper that he wrote uh, a few weeks ago. So over to you, Ruman. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I will uh, make a small clarification. Uh, I am not going to speak about the paper itself. Uh, I think uh, some people have read it, uh, and those who have not can, can read the paper. Uh, and I will not speak directly at this point about the agenda, reform agenda that we are going to discuss. I'd rather speak 
uh, about something which is in between uh, and which uh, concerns some aspects of the political economy of the needed reforms and with one particular aspect of this uh, uh, political of this political economy namely the external anchors that are have been and will be of uh, crucial importance uh, for Belarus now and in the future. So uh, let me start with what I wanted to say on this topic. Some uh, 20 plus years ago, Belarus opted for a closer economic integration with Russia. And this took the form of uh, the treaty on the creation of a union state with Russia, which was signed back in 1999. Uh, and this treaty envisaged uh, a very bold, uh, ambitious, uh, uh, agenda of uh, integrative measures, uh, including ultimately the objective of establishing a common currency. Later, Belarus also became member of the uh, Russia-dominated uh, Eurasian Economic Union together with four other post-Soviet states. So uh, the economic implications of this course towards economic integration with Russia have been both a blessing and a curse for Belarus and for the Belarusian economy. So the blessing in, in, in quotes uh, took the form of, um, uh, so what one could call integration dividend or loyalty rents such as energy discounts, uh, privileged access to the Russian market, and uh, some intergovernment access to intergovernmental credit at preferential terms. So in turn, this provided Belarus with uh, an implicit windfall financial cushion and the opportunity to pursue a more gradualist transition by delaying some uh, key transformational reform, such as the restructuring of the inefficient state-owned firms. Uh, although the level of such implicit uh, rents has varied from year to year, it still amounts to a regular non-negligible non resource uh, flow, inflow or transfer from Russia. So uh, the en energy discounts, they are difficult to measure precisely, but still, uh, as there is no established methodology, but still the IMF estimates are in the order of several percentage points of GDP. Uh, one part of this integration div dividend was the privileged access to the Russian uh, market, and Russia still accounts for about 50% of Belarusian exports. And this is especially important for the Be Belarusian manufacturing sector, which is still dominated by the large and often loss-making state-owned firms, which benefit from, from such preferences. And also Russia has served as what one could be call lender of last resort. Russia has now and again stepped in with monetary fin financial support in the form of government cre credit at preferential terms and access to, to credit uh, from the Russian, Russia dominated Eurasian Development Bank. So this was the blessing. But uh, uh, it, it had uh, the, the back, the coin has a backside. And the curse actually is a consequence of the blessing. Uh, over time, uh, the Belarusian economy became marred by what could be called a syndrome of rent addiction. So over time, the economy and the, the economy, economic policy mix have become accustomed to uh, to, uh, or even addicted to the presence of this uh, windfall resources. And uh, as this has continued for more than 20 years, the implications are deep seated as the rents have been factored in into the regular policy mix. So at present, a key question for the Belarusian society and its political elite is to address whether Belarus will continue to follow further the integration with uh, the Russia-dominated economic space, and especially with the envisaged integration with Russia. So the answer to this question will, to a large degree, shape 
both the economic and political future in the country. So uh, I will briefly uh, try to, uh, to flag uh, some of the possible scenarios. And first I will start with two extreme cases. The one extreme case is that Belarus confirmed the integration course as envisaged, envisaged in the treaty on the union state and a large part of the Russian political elite seems to favor such a path. So if Belarus opts for this, this path, Russia will continue to serve as the main external anchor and Belarus will continue to benefit from uh, these loyalty rents, probably even at larger amounts, especially if Belarus agrees, agrees to pursue all the objectives of the treaty, including the establishment of a common currency. So uh, consequently, the Belarusian economy would have to gradually adjust to the Russian economic policy course. And in the rest, it would uh, be basically a business as usual approach and no pressing need for radical reforms. However, the open question is whether the Belarusian society will be willing to accept a heavy price in the form of a loss of some important degrees of economic and political sovereignty. So the other extreme, uh, the uh, Belarus would opt for a radical departure from the previous integration course with Russia. So this could possibly the, be the case if an eventual escalation of the political crisis brings to power a totally pro-Western government, which would roughly speaking, follow some form of an Ukrainian scenario renouncing the treaty on the Union state and possibly also of the participation in the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. So in this case, one could realistically expect a Russian response equivalent to an abrupt discontinuation of all reins and inhibited access to the Russian market for Belarusian exporters. So the result will be, would be a severe shock to the Belarusian economy which will like, 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 likely translate into a deep and prolonged economic recession, sharp rise in unemployment, uh, financial crisis, possibly hyperinflation. The question here is whether the Belarusian society is informed about such possible consequences and whether it's willing to accept the inevitable economic sacrifice. So, while none of these two extreme cases can be excluded, it seems more likely that the future political and economic course would follow a line somewhere in between. This could take the form of a possible renegotiation of the treaty with Russia, abandoning possibly some of the most ambitious integration objectives, while at the same time, same time retaining, retaining Belarus's place in the Eurasian Economic Union. So what would be the economic consequences of such a course? One predictable outcome would be that Belarus's integration dividend will be radically downsized to the levels enjoyed by other members, countries of the Eurasian Economic Union. And Russia has clearly signaled that some of the rents, such as the exclusive energy discounts, will be discontinued if Belarus rejects the course of future close integration. And uh, this can be expected to happen in the course of the following one, two years. This means that the economy would be denied the resources amounting to several percentage points of GDP. So unless some urgent reforms are under undertaken already now, uh, over time, this could lead to the accumulation of large macroeconomic imbalances and ultimately to uh, a major economic and financial crisis. At the same time, the access to some of the integration dividend, uh, such as the privileged access to the Eurasian and Russian markets and possible credit from the Eurasian Development Bank could likely remain. So this means that the Belarusian policymakers would continue to dispose of, uh, of some uh, leeway to maintain some form of a more gradualist approach to the unavoidable economic reforms 
such as the restructuring of the loss-making state-owned enterprises and financial reforms. Uh, in this case, a uh, relatively smooth and peace, uh, successful transition to the new international env environment would require to start already now some urgent and radical reforms of the source that have not yet been done in Belarus. And as I said, any delay in these reforms may lead to a deep and uh, economic and financial crisis with unpredictable economic and political consequences. So this is what I wanted to say, and I will possibly address our Belarusian uh, uh, exports to also uh, possibly comment on these aspects of the political economy of reforms when addressing the main topics of our webinar. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ruman. I think this was an excellent uh, introduction, as you say, to the to the political economy, which is really, I think, at the heart of what we what we want to discuss today. I mean, I think you in, you raised three really important points. One is this central issue of the of the state-owned enterprises and and what happens with with them now. I think the second thing that you really brought out is is the central importance of the relationship with Russia, and how if that is changing as a result of this crisis, no, maybe not, but if it is that that will have huge economic ramifications for, for, for Belarus and for the, the whole model of, of Belarus. And I think the third interesting thing, which we may want to go into a, a bit more later in the discussion is this idea of scenarios and thinking through some of the scenarios and how this might, how this might play out from here. Um, I wanted to start with, with the state-owned enterprises because the way you've presented it, or at least you've hinted at it, is that we're at a kind of a juncture here and that this model, which maybe at times felt like it could go on forever, this rather different path of, of Belarus over the last 30 years, let's say, maybe cannot go on any longer in this, this state-owned enterprises now, things will have to change. And this is, this is a pr pretty serious, serious juncture. I mean, starting with you, Alexandra, I mean, is that how you would see it? Are we now at, do you think, some kind of inflection point uh, from the perspective of reform of the economy and the the state-owned economies in particular, and if so, what, what does that mean? Uh, you know, uh, it is quite difficult to discuss uh, prospects of uh, SOE's reform um, right now because uh, we have quite, uh, uh, well, unpredictable and uh, serious uh, political crisis in the country. So uh, we can just uh, um, discuss possible directions of uh, SOE's reform and the importance of SOE's reform. But uh, it is uh, very difficult to uh, discuss uh, political will. Uh, I mean, the will of the current uh, authorities to uh, start any kind of SOE's reform. Uh, well, economically, it is uh, like inevitable, it is necessary, it is absolutely important, crucial, because, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, retrospective, uh, you will see that uh, during the last uh, seven years, uh, uh, the Russian Swiss lost their role in the economy dramatically in terms of employment, in terms of generation of uh, Expert revenues uh, in terms of even uh, their role uh, in manufacturing. So everywhere where you can think about the Swiss as a cornerstone, as a driver of the economy, they uh, significantly lost their presence. And uh, but in terms of uh, generated problems for the economy, for the financial system, potentially for the uh, social protection system, they are still the champions. So in this regard, of course, it is absolutely important to uh, start uh, SOE's reform. But, you know, on top of, of this and uh, prior uh, uh, well, before I start the discussion about the SOE's reform, uh, I think that it is important to say that uh, generally uh, Belarus is a bit different from what it is, uh, how it is considered uh, from the point of view of the external experts and some domestic experts. First of all, uh, important point uh, was stressed by Rumen, 
Uh, many experts uh, say that okay, Belarus heavily depend on uh, the specific uh, conditions of uh, energy uh, pricing by Russia. So cheap oil, cheap gas, and then we have a competitive advantage. And then this rent addiction phenomenon appears. But in fact, uh, uh, there is a very interesting study uh, by, let me see the correct name, uh, financial integrity, global financial integrity report about illicit financial flows to and fro from 148 developing countries between 2006 and 2015. So uh, Belarus, uh, based on this data, appeared among top 30 countries uh, with the highest uh, illicit flows, with uh, the inflow of, uh, uh, f f from illicit exports uh, of uh, more than $6 billion. Uh, what does it mean? And it, it happened between 2006 and 2015. But later, uh, we continue to say, to consume benefits from this uh, preferential trade uh, energy goods with Russia. Uh, this means that, uh, well, our, our current structure of the economy, our current structure of uh, export, uh, well, uh, supply chains uh, allows uh, some companies to withdraw profits from uh, the state-owned enterprises and uh, in fact, yes, uh, they, uh, there is a rent addiction, but this rent uh, uh, does not go to the budget or to the population. It goes to some people, uh, well, some businessmen, let's call it like, like this. So uh, even from this perspective, it is crucially important to start SOE's reform because it would allow to, well, to increase the inflow of foreign currency to the economy and, in fact, to improve the financial status of uh, state-owned uh, enterprises. So, well, probably I will stop here and uh, maybe Dima will uh, continue. Awesome. Muted. This is this is very interesting what you're saying. So, and maybe I framed the the initial question the wrong way because uh, what you're saying, I think, is that you know this model has run out of steam a long time ago. Basically, this is maybe become more obvious or exacerbated by by what's happened this year, but it's not necessarily a new thing. And so the question then becomes, I think, and this is you know, a big question. It's maybe unfair to, to ask you even, but because it's the whole question of transition, really. But I mean how to change it, you know, how to reform, what are the steps to change this structure if it's not working, if, if, it's, uh, if, if it's become and, and has been then for years a problem. Uh, maybe first you, you Alexandra, and then, and then others as well. I mean, what, what are the steps to take or what would be the initial, what are the most important things to address? Yeah, you know, one of the most important uh, steps, uh, it in fact goes also to the area of uh, political economy. And it's related to incentives of the uh, management of state owned enterprises and uh, more generally about the well, division of the functions of the state as an owner and as a regulator. So now uh, there is a total mess in this term, and uh, the government uh, does not behave. Uh, many ways as an owner. So the idea is not to maximize uh, profit or I don't know, social benefits from uh, state-owned enterprises, but it is very difficult to even to define what are the goals uh, set up ahead of the state-owned enterprises. But uh, the pressure on management of the SOEs uh, is incredible because uh, they, do, they cannot... Uh, uh, so th there are no incentives for them to uh, behave rationally, to sell more, uh, more efficiently, but there is a pure incentive not to be uh, uh, very active, uh, just, uh, well, more or less keep uh, employment, more or less pay wages, more or less uh, uh, keep the required level of output, and that's it. But... Uh, uh, if you try to sell more efficiently, then there is no incentives for, for you, economic incentives, financial incentives as a uh, top manager of this enterprise uh, to 
to do so. And then, uh, but there are many sanctions that you, that you can have from the side of the state control committee or any other uh, controlling uh, agencies. So uh, for top managers, uh, you should create uh, very clear uh, economic incentives to uh, become a, an efficient uh, manager. And for this, of course, you should uh, develop uh, dramatically compared to the current uh, situation. You should develop uh, corporate governance at the state owned enterprises. Uh, and then, uh, like in a manner, uh, when the government starts to behave uh, as an owner, not uh, try to put any uh, like plans that. Uh, does not fit this function uh, of the government. So creation of proper incentives for state-owned enterprises, uh, managers, and uh, like a setup of the uh, well, well-functioning corporate governance. Uh, in addition to this, of course, you should create the whole range of uh, infrastructure for support of this reform, because you know you, this uh, management should be. Uh, well, should, should, should have necessary uh, uh, knowledge, you know, so you should create education, you should create uh, uh, infrastructure even for uh, efficient experts. So, you know, plenty of things uh, apart from just dealing with uh, the con concrete uh, state-owned enterprises. And of course, there is an important uh, option proposed by the World Bank, for instance, is that you should initially uh, uh, run strategic mapping of the state-owned enterprises, like select different types, like four types, they propose to select four types of state-owned enterprises. Uh, some of them can continue like before, so they are more or less efficient, profit-making, and uh, they can be kept in the state uh, ownership. Uh, then you have some companies that should be closed down, and then some that should be restructured in different uh, way. Uh, but uh, like also related to the very important story is uh, the level of the indebtedness. And uh, in this sense, it is also uh, important to everything about the state-owned enterprises that you can touch means that you should uh, start some additional reforms. For instance, if you want to uh, deal with uh, companies that have... Uh, dramatic level of uh, areas, uh, dramatic level of uh, indebtedness, then you should think about creation of market of uh, uh, bad debts, and then, then you should think about how, how to uh, improve the, uh, well, the portfolio of the banks that provided loans to these companies. So if you think about financing of uh, SOEs, then you should think about creation of the market or like of uh, the stock market uh, here in Belarus, like well-functioning, uh, because now we have the only source available for uh, finance, you know, state-owned enterprises, so like the biggest source available is uh, bank credits and that's it. So, you know, like <laughs> SOE's reform is a really uh, the core, uh, the, but it is, interconnected with all other reforms that should be uh, run in the economy and also to the, in fact, the public administration reform because it's about the way how the economy is uh, managed. And I want to also to, to, to look at uh, some of the social aspects of, of what these reforms would mean. But just before we go to that, Dimitri, I mean, We've heard so far, I mean, that, that, you know, the impression is we're kind of at an inflection point, something has to change, it cannot go on as it is on, in a very broad reform sense. I mean, is that also how you see it? And if so, I mean, what do you see as the way to go? Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think uh, what is very important uh, about the state-owned companies reform is to understand that Belarus is different uh, from, uh, for instance, uh, Eastern European countries in uh, the beginning of 90s. 
today, uh, at least uh, half of the Belarusian economy is uh, uh, private companies. And that is why uh, when we say about uh, the reform of state-owned companies, uh, first we should understand what is the problem about uh, state-owned companies. It does not mean as uh, two decades ago in Eastern European countries that the total economy is based on this state-owned company. In our case, the main harm, uh, the main problem, uh, this is, um, I would say, absorbing, pulling up extra resources in uh, state-owned companies, and uh, this is the main threat today for the economy, and actually it is associated with a uh, financial threat because uh, the debt uh, burden uh, in state-owned companies is it is extremely dramatic, and it has become extremely dramatic during the last um, five six years uh, due to modernization campaign, and uh, recently because of uh, rather specific uh, policies during uh, the COVID uh, nineteen. So. Uh, what is the conclusion uh, from uh, these points? My conclusion is that uh, we should not uh, overstate and exaggerate uh, the role of state companies. Uh, I agree with Alexander, yes, uh, the decision about uh, the uh, solution for further reforms, it heavily depends on uh, what we do with state-owned companies. But uh, the reform of state-owned companies itself, it's not so urgent and uh, in terms that we should uh, very rapidly make decisions uh, and we should not treat to state-owned companies as a whole, as a single unit. And uh, here with uh, the first step uh, we should do, uh, uh, this is the solution of the debt problem. And actually, uh, the decision about how we deal with the debts, uh, no, uh, potentially bad debts of state-owned enterprises, uh, it will predetermine uh, the further possibilities, further possible solutions in respect to state-owned companies. Uh, for instance, uh, if the government is ready and can afford uh, itself to uh, take the debts of state-owned companies on itself, uh, later on it uh, will give a chance for some of state-owned enterprises to survive. And as Alexandra, uh, Alexandra already mentioned, some of the state-owned companies uh, can exist uh, in, even in a modified environment. And the second step, uh, which is today on the agenda, is uh, introducing hard budget constraints. So uh, my point that uh, reform of state-owned companies, it does not obviously mean uh, rapid uh, privatization or rapid liquidation of the whole sector. First of all, uh, the issues of debts uh, should be tackled and there should be a strategic decision about how we uh, solve the problem with uh, debt overhang. And uh, the second uh, decision, this is introducing of hard budget constraints. After that, uh, we have some time to decide to make uh, about uh, state-owned enterprises not as a mess, but on a, uh, to make a segmentation about these enterprises. And in some cases, this will be prioritization. In some cases, uh, this will be liquidation and bankruptcies. In some cases, uh, state-owned companies, say, uh, for instance, Belarusian uh, Belkali, this is a uh, Potash Fertilizers producer, can exist as state-owned companies. That, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Dimitri. I think this is excellent kind of context and, and uh, for helping us understand, you know, this is really not a black and white issue. There's a lot of nuance in, in this question and we certainly cannot treat the whole thing uh, as one. Uh, I wanted to, and, and also what you said links to the, to the next thing I wanted to ask, which was about if we accept that the economy is going through or will go through a big reform uh, in the coming years, if we think that, for example, the role of state-owned enterprises might decrease further, what does that mean for, for employment and for, for social aspects in Belarus? And this actually links to a question that we had already on, on the Slido, which from Tobias, which asked about the share of, what is the share of total employment provided by the state now, if, if we know that? And how much, if we have big reform of, of some, at least some of the state-owned enterprises, what would realistically the, the share of employment be after that? So maybe we touch on this question specifically first, uh, and maybe Katarina, and then, and then we go a bit more into the, to, to the broader social uh, aspects of this. Um, 
Okay, so um, let me start by saying, well, thank you for having me here. And uh, I would like to add a bit about the comprehensiveness uh, of reforms needed to do privatization and uh, reform of state-owned enterprises. Is that, yes, well, privatization would be inevitable if we really want to change something, because right now we have... Uh, too many commercial state-owned enterprises. It shouldn't be like this. There is no reason, say, a shoemaking factory which operates on a, a competitive markets uh, should be state-owned, right? Uh, but uh, if we don't have changes to, to the rule of law, to the protection of uh, property rights uh, in the country, we will not be able to attract the investors or at least the investors we would like to see investing and privatizing our state-owned enterprises. So uh, indeed, this should be, you know, part of the uh, some global reform, well, not global, but really national reform agenda, not just privatization. Uh, as for the employment on state-owned enterprises, indeed it has, uh, decreased recently uh, and right now commercial state-owned enterprises uh, contribute 30 percent 30 percent to the total employment uh, another 20 percent is public employment so the, these are non-commercial state-owned enterprises right the uh, health uh, uh, education and government and uh, 50 percent is private sector and self-employment uh, so this is the current distribution, uh, and uh, while right now the unemployment rate in Belarus is quite low, even despite the COVID pandemic, we still have the unemployment rate by ILO standards less than 5%. This is not due to the state-owned enterprises. Uh, this is mostly due to the fact that our labor market is... Um, uh, well, basically it doesn't protect the rights of the workers at all. Most of them work on one year contracts so that the labor market is very flexible, like wild, wild west flexible. Uh, and um, that's why the employment is actually quite high because the cost of firing a worker is very low. So no one objects to hiring a worker when the time comes. Um, so this is uh, this is one thing. Another thing is that if we look at the role of state-owned enterprises in providing employment, indeed they played a huge role in the past, and that's why we didn't have uh, you know any other mechanisms of protecting workers because the state-owned enterprises they were kind of you know. Uh, well, this is the social protection system that we have. You can always go and get employment on the state-owned enterprise. Yes, that would not be your uh, dream job, right? That would be a shitty job with low salary, but that would be a job. Uh, this role has recently disappeared because state-owned enterprises, they um, face harder budget constraints. They uh, see difficult financial um, situation uh, and the biggest illustration of that is the crisis of 2015-2016 then what we saw was that the people uh, with lowest income were hurt by this crisis the most and this is this is in contrast with what has happened before in Belarus where in crisis people who were with higher incomes employed in the private sector usually they were the ones hurt during the crisis, right? In the recent crisis in 15, 16, it was on the contrary. So people who were employed by state-owned enterprises, well, they had, some of them lost their jobs, some of them had to work part-time uh, to take unpaid vacation, all of that without a meaningful system of social support, uh, without meaningful unemployment insurance or benefits, because the benefits that we have are very low in, uh, so basically they're like uh, 10, 20 euros per month and it's very difficult to get them. Uh, so, Virtually, they are non-existent. Um, so, uh, and this is this is of course, and well, no other system of social protection emerged instead of so, state-owned enterprises. And this is a problem. Uh, and uh, the result of this problem, what we see recently, is this growing uh, uh, inequality in the society. 
Uh, no matter how you slice it, we may look at inequality by industries. We may look at inequality between Minsk and regions. Uh, we may look at inequality between, you know, at gender wage gap. Every measure of inequality is actually growing. And that might be, you know, the reason, uh, one of the reasons behind the uh, political unrest that we see right now. Uh, and this is, this is again the challenge because if we start, of course, reforming state-owned enterprises, there is still some uh, excessive employment at some of them. And while, uh, say, for a state-owned enterprise in Minsk, it's not a problem, you know, to, uh, to liquidate this enterprise and people will easily find other jobs. Uh, if we talk about uh, small cities, or rural areas, that might be a problem for them. Because there are a lot of uh, what we call monotowns in Belarus, where a single state, well, usually state-owned enterprise, employs a high pro proportion of people, like over 20, 30% of population. So of course, if something bad happens to that enterprise, the whole economy of the town would suffer and we will need, you know, both uh, social support in form of unemployment benefits and some active labor market policies to manage that. Uh, so uh, I firmly believe that any reform of the state-owned enterprises, either that would be corporate governance or privatization or liquidation, it should be accompanied by, uh, you know, this uh, targeted measures of social support so that uh, people are able to find jobs and if that means that they need to shift sectors, for example. They need to get to be able to get training. They need to be able to get support to move to a new place where the job is, for example. So this is about the state-owned enterprises. And then there is a huge uh, uh, portion. Uh, so uh, right now our social support basically consists of uh, pensions and child benefits. And all these uh, areas will have to be reformed uh, sooner or later because we just don't have enough money to uh, support them as they are. But this is, you know, that could be a topic of a whole conversation, completely different one. Well, thanks, Katerina. I think you raised uh, quite a few important points there, actually. Um, and I'm kind of debating with myself which one to, to, to come back to you on first. I mean, I think you raised in a way a kind of central issue, which is that there's this, and this links also to a question that Peter Havlik has asked about uh, about transition and uh, the the experience of other of other countries. Because I think there's this stereotype of Belarus, and like all stereotypes, it's probably mostly not true, but a stereotype that this is a very unreformed economy has lots in common with the pre-Soviet times. There's a very high level of protection, full employment, low inequality. You know, this is the stereotype from the outside. And you've basically taken that stereotype apart in, in what you've said. I mean, does that mean then that actually, if we're saying that this is now the time of reform, either by choice or by force, that actually the transition from to something more like a typical Central and Eastern European economic model will actually be not as dramatic as maybe would be assumed by people who don't know as much as you. I mean, maybe you can answer this, but also others could also give a perspective, but you first, Katarina. Yeah, well, of course, as Dmitry said, we are no longer in the 90s. Uh, our uh, economy, you know, it's, it's well, even state-owned enterprises, they, they operate on competitive markets still, you know, they won't be in such a shock as uh, we were in the 90s. Uh, so that would be completely different. And in terms of uh, employment, yes, it's, uh, you know, 30% of population employed on state-owned enterprises. It's not 100%. Uh, so that would be much easier to manage. Uh, and if we have enough time, you know, to, to provide social assistance and help in finding a new job to everyone and um, provide a smooth transition. Ruman, maybe we can we can also bring you back in on this question. You're you're muted. Ruman, you you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry. It's okay. I, I already did it as well. <laughs> uh, we heard some very interesting stories from our Belarusian ex 
experts and uh, I, uh, they were all very insightful and uh, uh, informative. Uh, I would like to follow on some of the issues that were raised. Uh, yes, first of all, uh, the Belarusian economy has gone a long way from what uh, it was uh, 30 years ago and what other transition countries were 30 years ago, but it went, uh, as we can say, a different path. It, uh, it uh, undertook a different transition path and it has built a different model. It's by no means, it's, it's nothing similar to, to what it was, but it's a unique uh, uh, construction uh, which has been established. Uh, yes, the state-owned uh, uh, sector has been diminishing in size in, and importance. Uh, while there is a vibrant new private sector, in, especially in services, in the IT industry, and everybody knows that. Uh, the problem is that the state-owned sector, while still small in size, creates the biggest problems for the economy. Uh, um, due to the new, to numerous uh, factors that were already mentioned by, uh, by our experts, uh, it continues to act as a financial black hole. It uh, absorbs resources, but doesn't deliver. Its uh, overall efficiency is quite low. It's over indebted. Uh, I just read recently the information that the uh, total indebtedness, indebtedness of the state-owned enterprises already exceeds the, exceeds the value of uh, GDP. Uh, it has poor governance. Uh, uh, it has been reformed, but not quite in for, uh, uh, reformed to act as uh, market agents in the economy. The government interferes directly into the, into the uh, uh, performance of the uh, state-owned firms. So following on what Alexander said, uh, there is a whole range of reforms that need to be undertaken in order to rehabilitate the sector. Otherwise, it will continue to to, to act as this financial flow uh, in a black hole, and ultimately this, this is a potential source of a crisis, macroeconomic and financial crisis, as we have seen also in the past. Uh, however, uh, I will continue with what uh, Alex uh, said. Uh, uh, this is such a complex range of reforms, including the governance, uh, inclu including the uh, establishment of hard budget constraints, as uh, 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 Dmitry prompted, uh, in including uh, the, uh, so to say, uh, uh, much uh, uh, larger degree of care of, uh, for people who would lose their jobs. And all these reforms are interlinked. And uh, it takes a lot of time, it will take a lot of time to implement and institute these reforms, even if they are started now. So this is something, uh, unfortunately, it, it seems that the uh, high level of uh, uh, government uh, does not grasp the complexity of this situation, and there is not sufficient political will to start with them. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not at all certain if the current government will be uh, ready and willing to undertake these reforms. But as I say, in my view, if they are not started, if not now, but in the very immediate future, this, is, this will uh, create uh, much uh, uh, larger problems for the Belarusian e e economy in the future, which could be avoided if the reforms are taken now. Okay, I, I wanted also just to, to, because we've also had a couple of questions, to, 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 to ask one more thing about the, the labor market impact and the social impact of, of these reforms we're talking about. So, uh, Katarina, you already addressed a, a lot of this and you, and you spoke about inequality. So we had a question from Jovan Zubovic from the IEN in, in Belgrade asking about uh, inequality and noting that, uh, and also this was my perspective, that 
that Belarus at the moment scores pretty well among Central and Eastern European countries on on uh, on this measure. And then also linking back to the question from Peter Havlik about the experience of other transition economies. I mean, as Belarus goes through these reforms that we're talking about, um, is there a way to learn from what happened in other countries to avoid maybe some of the things that happened, the, the, the most problematic things that happened in, in other countries and to achieve this structural change without a big increase in inequality and serious uh, social fallout? That's for any, any of you who want to answer. Uh, so let me start about inequality. Indeed, uh, we do well uh, in international comparison. Uh, but if we go uh, comparing ourselves with the, ourselves like 10 years ago, what we see is this, um, unfortunately, I'm changing trend uh, for the increase in inequality. Uh, so uh, one of the drivers of this increase is exactly the success of the IT sector, which is concentrated in Minsk, which is, you know, dominant, uh, male dominated. So it drives, you know, all kinds of inequalities at once. Uh, and, uh, you know, the existence of the IT sector is a good thing for the economy. But, uh, uh, of course, when uh, we see uh, that in one sector, the average wage is like uh, six times higher than the average wage in the country, that creates uh, certain uh, tensions and... Uh, mm, well, this is from the political perspective, this is not something good. And we start asking ourselves, maybe we should do in other sectors exactly the thing that we did with the IT sector so that it can also grow, you know? And the, the, the major thing we did with the IT sector is that the government is out of there. It's, it's, the state is not there. Uh, so um, uh, this is one of the drivers, but other drivers is that again, the regional economies are mostly sustained by the state-owned enterprises and they are fading away and uh, regions are getting poorer and this is again this is a problem this is a problem we see it already in uh, uh, PISA scores uh, school children in regions are like one year behind from school children in regional centers this is I think a huge problem for a state which says that it's you know it's social it's pro equality and it offers opportunity for everyone do any of the other panelists want to want to say anything on this if i may uh, so concerning inequality indeed uh, it is not only uh, uh, the great uh, problem if you compare belarus uh, to its neighbors uh, but also it is not the big uh, issue in terms of at least it was uh, in terms of perception by the population because based on the uh, international uh, public opinion polls uh, inequality okay was uh, somewhere in the middle or even lower than the middle of the list of the problems uh, of belarus uh, uh, well as it was perceived by population and it is uh, quite important uh, in addition to this issue that uh, belarusians uh, uh, again, what happened during the uh, last, I don't know, 30 years or 20 years probably here is that uh, Belarusians uh, understood that the private sector is a driver of economic growth and employment uh, generator in this country. And in this sense, uh, Belarus reforms in Belarus uh, may create very, uh, well, bright opportunities for the country because uh, you know uh, you should not uh, assure Belarusians that private sector is good for the economy that markets are good for the economy because uh, while well, majority uh, believes that you know businessmen they are creating jobs but not stealing money from the like ordinary people and it is very important because uh, like 20 years ago, Belarusians were in more or less the same situation where now the Central and Eastern Europe population is. Uh, so they believe that okay, a private sector is not good for the economy. They uh, well, believe that uh, states should have higher role in the economy. But now if you look at the most recent uh, European value study, 
uh, the last round was in 2017, beginning of 2018, and now the results are available at the website. Uh, then you will see that there is one very interesting question. Uh, uh, yes. uh, so choose between two alternatives, uh, either uh, the state should increase its role in the economy or the private sector should increase its role in the economy. And Belarusians, they are number one in Europe uh, in terms of the people who believe that the private sector share in the economy should increase. So even slightly higher than Switzerland <laughs> and Austria third place. So, you know, uh, <laughs> Belarus loves private sector, Belarusians loves private sector. So in this sense, uh, reforms definitely will be supported by uh, people. And in this sense, you know, uh, I think if reforms, uh, if start, uh, if to start reforms, then um, we have a chance for very fast development. Unfortunately, the major problem is not even the absence of the political will. Now we can't talk about the political will at all because we do not have, uh, well, the legitimate uh, authorities uh, in the country. And in this sense, we should first pass uh, through the political crisis, find a way out of this crisis. And then definitely, uh, if we uh, do so, then we will have a chance for quite fast development. Okay, uh, we talked uh, for almost an hour now, and we focused basically only on the on the domestic economy. I wanted to turn now a bit to, to the external aspects of, of this crisis, and I will come first to you, Dimitri. I mean, Belarus has this external financing gap. We, we know that it's, it's discussed a lot, you know, how can it be filled, we'll finance it. In the end, it always turns out pretty much okay. Do you think anything in that sense has fundamentally changed in this crisis? Thank you, Richard. Uh, directly from this crisis, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, if we say about uh, external debt, uh, both gross external debt and public debt, and um, the major challenge, the major problem for Belarus, it is not uh, the level of debt itself, uh, because if we look at the uh, debt uh, burden ratio, it is not so uh, huge for Belarus. The major problem and the major challenge uh, that uh, this debt is almost uh, fully nominated in the foreign currency. And if we say about public debt, um, own uh, e uh, incomes of the budget are not sufficient uh, enough to uh, secure uh, the expenditure for servicing this debt. And uh, this is the issue, uh, this is the problem. And uh, what uh, the current crisis contributed uh, to the urgency of uh, debt problem that um, Okay, uh, let me please uh, go uh, a step uh, back. Uh, and uh, from this situation, what is important to know, to understand about Belarus, that during the last couple of years, uh, the strategy of both uh, the government and uh, major companies that uh, borrowed from abroad was uh, debt refinancing. Actually, the government tried to refinance uh, the debt almost fully. And from this point of view, access to external finance was extremely important. And now what have happened uh, since recently? Uh, since recently, uh, sure, the excess and the cost of borrowing uh, for Belarus, both for uh, the government and for uh, private sector, uh, the cost is uh, rising and the excess is uh, narrowing. And uh, sure, this is a problem in terms of uh, refinancing. But uh, uh, this, I would say, mm, does this mean an uh, immediate uh, threat, immediate uh, problem in terms of financial stability? Uh, if the situation does not change, yes. But uh, this, I would say, a second important reason. The first important reason, this is the quality of domestic debt. And while they're uh, interrelated with the external debt, uh, 
either uh, from this interlinkage can become a trigger. For instance, if the, uh, the problem with the asset, uh, with the quality of debt on the domestic market, sure, it will uh, somehow spread uh, the quality of debt in, uh, in relations with non-residents and it will cause additional problems uh, with debt sustainability uh, with external Partners. But current political crisis itself, I would not overstate and, uh, the role of it, uh, because uh, we should understand that currently we say that market, uh, uh, that fin uh, market uh, access to market uh, is narrowing, but uh, a huge portion of uh, external finance from Belarus, it was, I would say, politically motivated. It's actually uh, roughly 70% of external uh, debt of uh, Belarusian government. This is uh, debts, uh, borrowings from Russia, from China, from uh, Eurasian Bank. And uh, from this point of view, the situation is still almost the same. The problem now may be that uh, it will be harder to uh, refinance uh, those remaining uh, of uh, roughly 30 percent that uh, came previously from uh, Western market. So, in concluding, I would say that uh, uh, financial considerations uh, in association with uh, current political crisis, current situation, they are important, uh, but this is uh, not uh, the problem number one. I would say uh, this is a secondary uh, issue and uh, domestic problem like the quality of domestic debts, uh, the efficiency of state-owned enterprises and those bad debts that they generate. Uh, this is uh, the major problem that can be exhibited by uh, external financial conditions. That's very interesting. I mean, could you say a bit more about this? You, you talk about the quality of domestic debts. I mean, what, what do you mean exactly by this? And also, has is this something that has been changed by events this year? Uh, yes, uh, this uh, has made, um, severely been changed during uh, this year. Uh, but um, I must begin mainly with modernization campaign in this regard, uh, because a very rapid accumulation of debt has begun um, somewhere in 2012, 2013. This was a huge uh, concept by the government that we should re-equip uh, state-owned enterprises and it uh, should secure a growth of effectiveness, efficiency and secure uh, uh, productivity growth throughout the economy. Actually, it was a huge failure of this concept and uh, one more important issue uh, that uh, almost all these debts, as I have already mentioned, were accumulated in foreign currency. And uh, while it, uh, in majority of cases, did not result in a growth of uh, productivity uh, and at the same time we remember a uh, significant depreciation in 2015 and uh, later on during uh, this year uh, the debt overhang the debt burden uh, for state-owned enterprises increased uh, dramatically being nominated mainly in foreign currency while uh, the revenues uh, the bigger part of a uh, fraction of revenues is nominated in domestic currency. So the debt burden increased dramatically. Uh, and uh, while the productivity of uh, majority of SOS of those borrowers are still stagnating, uh, their, their um, ability to service this debt in many cases it is very doubtful. And what is, uh, uh, if we look at the official statistics of um, uh, from the banking sector, uh, this does not fully reflect the scope of the problem. Why? Because the government is actively uh, restructuring this debt uh, with some specific uh, practices. Uh, we call it uh, here financing injury, engineering. Actually, this is a rather complicated schemes uh, that finally either the government itself takes these debts on it. And uh, today it is very interesting situation that roughly, as you remember, 40% of total debts of uh, all the firms and enterprises in Belarus. This is uh, not uh, the debts uh, to banks, but the debt directly to the government. 
and a huge fraction, a huge portion of the debt, it is accumulated by uh, the agencies, agencies associated with the government, either the development bank or we also have, it is not so famous, uh, so-called uh, the agency form maybe it should be translated non-performing loans. Uh, it also accommodates uh, plenty, uh, plenty of debt. And these debt are not uh, um, adequately uh, presented in this statistic. So today, uh, the situation with the debt overhang and more uh, important, the quality of this debt is not um, uh, transparent. And uh, so uh, if we look from the bank, uh, bank side, it show only the part of the picture and there are um, grounds to think that the situation is really on the edge of the uh, huge uh, problems, I would say. Uh, so, so that's it. Uh, this, you, you, the last thing you said preempted exactly the question I, I was then going to ask you, but also open it up for the other panelists as well. I mean, the, the, the situation you described sounds very unsustainable. I mean, what is it that's actually stopping a crisis happening right now? And under what conditions could things really deteriorate? Maybe Ruben or others would like to come in as well. You, you're muted again, Ruben. Sorry. Uh, before answering the last question, I would like to continue a little bit on what uh, Dimitri just said. Uh, when we s we come back again to the state-owned enterprises and uh, the debt overhang which is uh, accumulated there, so uh, in principle it has two components. Dealing with with uh, such a situation has two components: dealing with the stock problem and dealing with the flow problem dealing with the stock, dealing with what is already accumulated, but not the less important is dealing with the stop, discontinuing further accumulation of new debt. So these should be taken uh, at the same time. As regards the stock, uh, as Dimitri said, uh, uh, the Belarusian authorities have been extremely ingenious in financial engineering through various schemes, uh, basically, uh, doing some type of, type of uh, laundering of the bad debts through various operations. But in the end, whatever it happens, this only delays, uh, delays uh, the problem and uh, it's coming to the open. Uh, in the end, these are all contingent fiscal li liabilities, uh, which sooner or later will have to be monetized. And once they are monetized, uh, it's either uh, a rise in inflation or another form of a financial crisis. Uh, how long this can be sustained? Probably it can be still be sustained for some time. But I'm, I, I'm coming again to the key issue. Unless reforms, some form of reforms are initiated already now, at least to stop the accumulation, to dealing with the flow problem, uh, uh, then indeed at some point it will become unsustainable and a, a crisis will not be, uh, cannot be avoided. Alexander, you, you want to also jump in on this question? No, I absolutely agree that, uh, well, first of all, the economy uh, sometimes uh, seems to be very, uh, uh, strong, not, not entity, but strong thing because you expect the crisis and the crisis uh, does not happen. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the crisis uh, would uh, have happened uh, uh, in case of uh, soft monetary policy, but uh, as long as the monetary policy was quite adequate. To the, uh, situation, uh, the crisis has not happened yet. Uh, uh, and the whole logic of uh, how the situation is developing uh, would lead to the uh, first uh, round of uh, crisis, uh, not later than the first quarter of the next year, beginning of the second quarter of the next year. I mean, in terms of uh, the crisis, which may be related to uh, 
financial sector, to banking sector, and to uh, uh, government debt. Uh, well, even in case if we uh, do not have, uh, if we will not have the like fully fledged uh, crisis, we may have very serious uh, pressure on foreign currency reserves, and we will have this pressure on foreign currency reserves. Uh, uh, in the situation when the foreign uh, debt markets are closed for Belarus, we have the only uh, source uh, to either to try to assure Russia that they should help us with resources, which is quite difficult now. And recently uh, we've heard uh, uh, from Russian TV the clear statement that we cannot uh, provide financial support to those who violate their like obligations. And in this sense, uh, well, the only source is uh, foreign currency reserves. So, and in case if they start to contract even faster than they are contracting this year, uh, then we will have all the range of problems for our external debt. And I, as I understand, tomorrow OECD uh, should decide about the uh, well position of Belarus. So whether we will stay in the sixth group of countries in terms of the sovereign uh, uh, risk, or we will fall to the second or to the seventh group. I don't know. At, at least the current uh, ranking uh, sixth group uh, is uh, valid till tomorrow. <laughs> So uh, all of this uh, influence, not only the sovereign credit ranking, but also the credit ranking, of course, of our banks, and so the ability of uh, our banks to uh, attract money, even in Russia. But not only this, uh, but uh, the, uh, some loans where uh, some financing was obtained, uh, uh, well, with some covenants and in case if we uh, will not meet these covenants uh, now we may have a huge outflow of uh, resources from the banking sector and from the, from the corporate uh, sector too so like many uh, uh, well many different channels of uh, financial crisis uh, exist. although the uh, total volume of outflows that may be expected for the uh, upcoming year uh, is not uh, well probably will not <laughs> destroy the financial sector but will create definitely plenty of problems you mentioned R russia a couple of times and i wanted to to turn back to this now because Ruman also talked about it quite a lot in his introduction and to frame it in the sense of belarus's external relations external economic relations in particular so Part of that is obviously politics, part of it is the financing, part of it's also trade. And we also had a few questions about this. So one was about, um, is there a way for Belarus to go to, to integrate more with, with the EU as well? Uh, what about World Trade Organization membership? There's also a question about what are the plans of the opposition in this sense? I don't know how much you want to, to talk about that specifically. Uh, the political part, but I mean, is there a scenario whereby, whether under the current administration or a possible future administration, of a fundamental change in terms of Belarus's external economic relations that this, because in the end, so much of this comes back to Russia, what we've been talking about, you know, is, is there a scenario whereby this really changes? That's for, for any of you who want to address this rather broad question. Okay. Uh, you know, I would say today Belarus is really at uh, rather severe crossroad, and I agree with Ruman, uh, who at the very beginning said uh, that absolutely different scenarios, the the probability of them are more or less uh, comparable, at least. And uh, but um, uh, if again um, remembering those uh, Ruman's uh, scenarios, I would say uh, the scenario somewhere in the middle nevertheless, it is much more probable. 
because uh, even if the uh, political power changes very rapidly, uh, this does not mean a very rapid uh, geopolitical or uh, reorientation or ec economic reorientation. It is not just a political issue because um, ties with uh, Russia, uh, they have been institutionalized uh, due to Eurasian um, uh, economic union. And even if there's a political decision to quit uh, this union, and uh, I don't uh, believe that the, such a political decision, uh, that there will be a kind of consensus in the society about this uh, decision, but even if the decision happens, it will take time. Uh, and uh, even more probable uh, that uh, still in the Belarusian society, economic cooperation with Russia and understanding that uh, economically Belarus uh, depends on Russia rather thoroughly, it is still there. And that is why uh, the issue of uh, leaving uh, the Eurasian Union, I think uh, it will not um, be on the agenda uh, very soon uh, under different uh, political scenarios. So uh, saying about uh, considerable geopolitical orientation, I would not say this is uh, the actual uh, problem on the agenda today. And you know, I really like very much as a statement of one Belarusian philosopher who was uh, saying about just political situation, but in our discussion, I think it is actual as well. He said that Belarusian society has abandoned uh, geopolitical uh, concerns and geopolitical focus uh, in the country. And I think it is really so, and what is uh, happening today is not about geopolitical orientation, it is uh, more about uh, domestic issues and how they should be organized and uh, formed. I absolutely agree here uh, with Dima, because uh, we have uh, our central interest, I mean, I, I can say it's one of the Belarusians, uh, our central interest is Belarus, not Russia or not the West. So first of all, we should defend our own interest. And uh, somehow, uh, well, not talking about the current moment, but somehow it is absolutely interconnected in the topic of partnership. So uh, if we want to defend our own interests, then we should build partnership both with Russia and with the West. But not partnership, but, but partnership, not some, I don't know, uh, being protectorate of any of the sides. So this is quite clear interest. So we have half of the economy, as colleagues mentioned, uh, in the hands of uh, our, well, mainly of domestic uh, well, uh, persons, domestic businesses, private sector. And uh, in this sense, okay, uh, we should not uh, somehow, uh, well, uh, abandon their interests because this is the interest of our uh, our own people. So, but in, in terms of uh, Russian uh, position towards Belarus, I think that now there is a moment of truth for them also because. Uh, uh, before they should uh, think about this union state of Belarus and Russia. But now I think that they understood, probably, I hope, that, and or, or they will understand that uh, the only way to defend their own interest here, uh, I mean, uh, the interest of, like, well, understandable way of doing business here, safe transit through Belarus, uh, and also, well, keeping uh, all these uh, agreements in terms of, uh, free movement of people and of capital that were reached until now. Uh, I think that the only way is to build partnership with Belarus, not to try to incorporate it in any ways. So I think in many ways, Russia is much more interested in uh, building partnership and finding somehow a safe ground for further relationship with Belarus. It's all these old myths that Belarus uh, will definitely choose the West in case if Russia like, would lose its grasp over Belarus. I think that uh, this piece should be destroyed and somehow we should move forward towards from this uh, building somehow uh, this uh, mythological uh, union state to building you know, partnership and economic integration, but with, with both uh, parties. 
Katarina, how do you see this? Oh, let me just reiterate, because I think it's important that none of the sides of the political conflict actually have talked about uh, uh, breaking economic ties with Russia. And both sides, including uh, uh, Lukashenko, have talked before about the need to diversify both uh, politically and economically. Uh, so I think we have a consensus here, and I think every Belarusian agrees that uh, yes, Russia is a long-term partner and there are some important economic ties that shouldn't be, you know, just severed and thrown away. But we should also look elsewhere because Russia is no longer the engine of growth for us. We, we have one specific question, which maybe one or more of you wants to touch on uh, uh, about this, which asks about the specific trading relationship with the EU and that Belarus doesn't at the moment have most favored nation status in trade with the EU. Could the removal of this somehow compensate for any lost subsidy from Russia? Anybody want to comment on this one? Let me very briefly, I'm not an expert in trade issues, uh, but as far as I understand uh, that uh, Eurasian Union agreement it uh, restricts considerably uh, the possibilities of concluding agreements uh, with Western counterparts. And this is the problem. Uh, so as far as I understand, uh, we cannot have free trade agreements, even the sectoral free trade agreements uh, with Western counterparts. Uh, or it can be uh, approved only at the level of the Eurasian Union. And uh, such kind of agreements may be concluded only for trading uh, services. So uh, if uh, I'm not mistaken, uh, Belarus here feels the lack of room for maneuver in uh, its trade policy. But uh, this uh, obviously does not mean that we can trade only with Russia. Sure, we can develop and we must develop, this goes without saying, uh, trade with other countries. But uh, it mainly depends not with uh, trade barriers, uh, it mainly depends on the productivity and the possibility of uh, Belarusian producers and access uh, other options for access to the foreign markets. Okay, uh, Roman, sorry, please, yes. Uh, and, uh, just to add one detail, uh, I think Dimitri is uh, completely right that membership in the Eurasian Union restricts the uh, opportunities of individual countries to have agreements with third parties and actually this is part of the overall thrust of the Eurasian Union which well uh, under the Russian influence wants to be treated as something as a, a subject of international relations and uh, actually the Eurasian Union uh, Russia and the Eurasian Union have been trying for a long time to establish such uh, high level relations with with the European Union. So for, for them to be recognized as an equal partner of the European Union, uh, but this is something that the European Union has been uh, rejecting all the time and uh, uh, so this is a conflict which at this point point doesn't uh, seem to have a resolution. Okay, we are coming towards the end of, of our time now, unfortunately. Um, I would, well, there are many other things I would like to ask you, but I think to, to finish, we have about six or seven minutes left. I would like to return to the main question that we started with. So the ways out of the impasse in Belarus. We talked a lot about reforms, about labor markets, about finance sector, about the external sector. Um, to finish, I think it would be very interesting to hear from you all, just a, a short statement, one or two minutes each, uh, to condense for you, what are the two, three most important points to emphasize in terms of, you know, understanding also the political economy, the context that we're in, as Ruman talked about at the start, what are the ways out of this impasse uh, as you see it. And um, maybe we can start again with, with Ruman and then we'll go around, around the group. Um, okay, so 
what I got for myself from the current uh, webinar is that we have excellent Belarusian experts who are fully aware of the problems that the Belarusian economy is facing. Uh, I'm sure there are also uh, international par partners who would be willing and capable of assisting Belarus in undertaking the needed reform. Uh, but it seems that the issue comes again to the political economy and to an aspect which was mentioned by one of our Belarusian colleagues, uh, the issue of the uh, credibility and legitimacy of, uh, of, the, of the power in Belarus. So the, the problem is that probably even if the current leadership is, has all the political will and is willing to press with reforms, it will be very difficult to, to, to start and implement it due, due to the lack of credibility and leg legitimacy. And on the other hand, uh, the problem is that if these reforms are not initiated now, problems will accumulate, imbalances will ac accumulate, and the probability of a major crisis will increase. So, frankly, I could not <laughs> see for myself the answer to this dilemma. Maybe my Belarusian colleagues will help me. Okay, maybe now I'll turn to, to you, Katarina. Um, I mean, it's, it is an unfair question to ask, but I mean, if you can really distill it to two or three points, I mean, what would you like, to, what would you emphasize uh, here as, as the way out of this crisis? I think all of us would say one and the same thing, that the major thing is the restoration of trust between the government and the society. And uh, uh, probably it will only be possible with uh, some kind of transfer of power after the dialogue um, of the current government with the society. Um, and afterwards, I think, uh, what would remain would be technicalities because there is understanding and uh, desire uh, on the side of the society as for example Alexander mentioned that people support uh, right now market reforms and it's only about you know having the political will to do them there is uh, public support to do them we know how to do them without huge social costs we know how to avoid mistakes because we're doing it later than all the other countries so so after this, uh, you know, very small issue of lack of uh, trust uh, between the government and the society is removed, uh, then we, we will be fine. If not, it's not only about the possibility of crisis, but it's also about, you know, uh, that we may just have uh, stagnation for yet another years, and we already had the lost decade, and we cannot afford to lose any more time, I think. Okay, Alexander. You know, as Katy mentioned, uh, all of us will say pretty the same things. And, uh, you know, just uh, yesterday we obtained uh, the results of our small, and uh, we launched a monthly uh, poll of uh, private companies. Uh, you know, it is not uh, some uh, large study, uh, we just uh, run the survey among the clients of uh, our IPM business school mainly. So 70% of these 100 companies are from uh, Minsk and uh, they're quite successful. Uh, well, financially and economically, uh, they uh, feel themselves quite good. But uh, in addition to all these regular questions uh, asked by OECD, for example, we asked uh, the question about the perception of uh, current uh, risks in the country. And uh, from the scale from one very low risks to five very high risks, uh, we have the average score of 4.4. No. Uh, none of the respondents uh, chose very low or low risks. They started from middle to high and more than 50% of them uh, said that the risks are very high. 
So even the companies that feel themselves, uh, well, economically good, uh, financially acceptable, uh, they uh, do not trust that this may keep in the future. So they're just afraid about their perspectives. And uh, in case of uh, this uh, fear will not be removed, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you cannot uh, start any reforms uh, without this like preliminary uh, assistance. Okay, Dimitri. Thank you. Uh, you know, in my view, what we have uh, discussed, uh, um, we showed that uh, current situation, this is a complicated combination of institutional weaknesses and uh, short-term distortions. And uh, both of them, as Peter mentioned, deal with the issue of credibility and issue of trust. Uh, so uh, in this view, uh, my prescription, uh, the first step in my prescription is very simple. Uh, yes, this uh, trust, this credibility should be restored. And the only uh, thing for this as a very first step, I see this is a political step. This is new elections. Unless new elections happen, I don't believe that it is possible to seriously say about the restoration of trust and credibility. And points two and three, they, in my view, should come together. Uh, this is uh, preventing uh, the financial crisis. And for this, uh, the issue of debt that's, uh, that we were discussing should be resolved. Uh, this includes uh, both the flow and stock in uh, Roman's terminology. Uh, issues and uh, the third, uh, this is at least a declaration about institutional reforms. At least that we are ready to uh, launch a program of institutional reforms and we are ready to start it in uh, as soon as possible. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have reached the end of our time. Uh, I want to say thank you to the audience for, for being here for a lot of interesting questions. I, I asked as many of them as, as I could. Um, thank you very much to the panelists. Ruman, thank you also for your help, in, for your idea and for, for helping to organize. And of course, to the colleagues in Belarus, as I said at the start, we cannot really imagine your reality at the moment, but we very much appreciate that, that you make the time and you are willing to speak with us on these topics. I think we learned a lot. I think, as I was saying, for example, to Katarina, I think we exploded a lot of myths actually about the Belarusian economy here. We we put some light on the gray areas, I think, and we all understand now, uh, well, those of us who are not uh, complete experts like you all, um, uh, how this is a complicated question. There are no easy answers here. There, there is no maybe quick fix. I think, you know, the idea of a crossroads or inflection point, these are quite overused terms, but it does feel like that for, for Belarus. It feels like, from what you've all said, that, as Dimitri was saying in the conclusion, Partly these are long burning issues, but there are some short term factors which have brought a lot of issues to a head and things one way or another uh, are going to change. And I think these kind of discussions with very informed experts about how to think about that from a policy side are extremely important. And I suspect this will not be the last uh, discussion that we have on this topic. So um, I will say bye now uh, for, for, from me. Um, we hope to stay in touch. Uh, we hope everything goes well for you, for, for, for our panelists uh, in the coming months. And I very much look forward to, to, to future discussions with, with all of you on this topic. So again, thank